from Stone Mountain, Georgia, this is the Bryant Land Show, hosted by proud Gamecock and South Carolinian AB3. All right, now everybody, welcome to another episode of the Bryant Land Show, January 27th, 2020. Let me tell y'all, man, the year is already uh, picking up steam, gaining speed, if you will, to be flying by. Can't believe we are already in the last week of January. It seems like just a few weeks ago, everybody was on some New Year, New Me, and New Year's resolutions and all that stuff, and we are already 27 days in to the year 2020 so hopefully you are still on track with whatever goals or uh resolutions that you set if you haven't set any resolutions kind of like myself you're just out here trying to get things done and take care of business still wish all the best to you so hopefully you are on the right track speaking of on the right track we are on track today to have a great show my guest is brian griffin from porter outdoors up in illinois now brian and i met a couple of years ago we started goose hunting together he guides goose hunts up there in illinois and to me great guy one of the best that there is uh we're gonna go through some uh psychology as far as uh far as laying out decoys uh just kind of talking about how he got into it and He's going to showcase some of uh, his calling skills. So last time I was with Brian, I had a chance to hunt with him. His dad was in the blind with him. Of course, his dad taught him everything uh, that he knows. So just really a great time that we had a few weeks back down, or should I say up, in Illinois. So I'm not going to do a whole lot of chitter chatter. I'm going to let the interview speak for itself. Like I said, we had a great conversation, just kicking back, shooting the breeze, talking about goose hunting, talking about hunting in general. Good time with my guest, Brian Griffin. So as per usual, I'm going to fall back. You guys kick back, I mash the uh, record button and let you guys in on my conversation with Brian Griffin here on the Bryantland Show. Bryant Land. You know what they say when you meet people, when you start hunting, sometimes you meet them and they end up just kind of being like a hunting buddy or a friend for life. I've fished with this man. I've hunted geese with this man. And now he is joining me on the show. Brian Griffin, I'm so thankful for you joining me. Appreciate you stopping in, man. What's going on? How much, man? Thank you for having me on. I'm very excited to be on here with you. I know. We talked about it a couple of times, and then I know, I think it was year before last, you did the piece for me for um, guides, which will be in the show notes, so you guys can go and check that out. But yeah, no, it's great to get you on, because I wanted to talk to you just a little bit more about goose hunting, because I was down in Arkansas the other day. I was hunting with a couple of guys. And they said they'd never been goose hunting. Like, they always, you know, like, hunted ducks or whatever. And I was just like, man, like, goose hunting is highly slept on if you don't do it, if you don't know about it. I was like, the guy that I go with, first class, like, caller, everything. Like, he, it's top-notch, you know, operation. Like, he got everything under control, man. And it's just a joy just to watch him do it. And when those geese come down and get in your face, you know, people always talk about the timber and birds coming through the timber and crackling new leaves and branches and stuff. I don't know, man. When those geese, when they're hovering over you and you bring them in from so far out and then they're hovering over and you pop up out of there, that's a pretty cool feeling, too. It's pretty cool, man, to see them big birds get right in your face, for sure. And they're, you know, and they're, like you said, they're a lot bigger than, you know, like the ducks and stuff. I mean, I got a couple that I've got stuff that I've killed with you that I've taken to the taxidermy, and people have seen them, and they're just like, wow. And I'm like, yeah, that's, <laughs> like, those, these aren't any babies. So what goes into 
making you the goose hunting machine, if you will, that you are? Like, how early do you start, like, scouting and just formulating a plan? Like, what, what, take me through that. I mean, it's always in the works. I mean, it's just, the last day of the season was a couple of days ago, and the work begins right now. You know, we're looking for spots for next year, you know, seeing what's going to be planted in the fields for next year. Um, as far as the calling, I mean, it never stops. I mean, the, the game is always changing. The, uh, the calling, the techniques, the different sounds, it's, it's constantly evolving, and we're just playing the game, trying to learn as much as we can in it. But, uh, no, we're looking forward to next year. But, uh, no, I mean, we're, we're looking at spots for next year starting now. What are we going to put? How are we going to hunt it? Wow. Are we going to put a pit in there? Are we going to put a blind in there? Uh, what do we got to do to get in here? Wow. So do you go, like, you just have, like, the relationships with the farmers, and they basically tell you, like, okay, we're going to rotate this crop this year or we're going to plant this coming up uh, for the next year, and then you just kind of, like, attack it from that standpoint? Typically, yeah. I mean, for the most part around here, you know, northern Illinois, it's uh, it pretty much goes a corn bean, corn bean rotation. This year was uh, a lot different from – in the springtime, we had uh, we were wet. It was a downpour the whole summer. Uh, it got the farmers to plant later than normal, mm. if they could plant at all. There were a lot of spots that did not get planted, so uh, that was uh, an obstacle that we made work. We hunted sheet water. Uh, there were fields that didn't get planted, but they were they were holding water, and uh, they we made them turn into a goose magnet for us. Wow. So you say sheet water, that's like when you're riding by and you see those fields and they basically look like little lakes. They're like standing water. That's it. That's game on, man, for sure. Nice. Nice. Now, and then you said, too, that, you know, like with your calls and stuff, so you always, like, practicing? Like, are you driving, like, your wife crazy, like, out in the garage or, like, walking around the house just, like, working on another cadence or yeah for sure i mean i'm down in the man cave right now that's where i can do uh, a little bit until uh i start hearing her banging on the uh banging her foot on the floor uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean the calls are they go with me everywhere they're always in the truck and you know you it, it's as simple as you know what you're you're at the park mm -hmm. and you're doing something else and you you look at the geese and you hear them Wow, I've never heard that. I want to check that out. Why is he doing that? Mm -hmm. Oh, he's doing that to tell our mother geese to get away or get over here. Hey, the food's over here. So uh, you're you're always looking at that stuff. What what can I use to my advantage to trick these things? Wow. And because it, it's funny because, like, I was just thinking the other day, like, probably of all the calls, that the ones that I feel most comfortable with, is the diaphragm call for turkeys. And I was reading, you know, something about how, like, you know, the world champion turkey callers, they obviously they practice every day. You know, there's all kind of videos, like, on YouTube. But it was, like, something was going off in my mind. I was just thinking, I was like, man, I need to start picking up my turkey call and just start it working, you know, start working it and getting back into it. Because March, you know, for us down here in Georgia, March will be here before you know it. And once the season starts, obviously you make tweaks and stuff like that, but that's not the time. Like you don't want to be the guy that the first time you pick up your call is, you know, two weeks before the season starts. And I would imagine it's just, like you said, the same thing with uh, goose season. For sure. I mean, it's it's picking it up. It's flux, moans. It's, it's muscle memory. It's picking it up. Um, you know, I'm thinking about the sounds that I'm making, but I'm not thinking about how I'm making it. If that makes any sense. Mm, yeah, kind of like a, like you said, muscle memory, almost um, second nature. Exactly. You don't forget to, to ride a bike. You right. Know, I, I don't forget how to blow my goose call. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe sometimes they do when the geese don't come in, but but yeah, it's it's second nature. You want it to be just as natural as, as anything you do. You know, that's that's your call. Now, how many calls are you working with when you're down there? Because I know I've seen you. You know, when we're out and you might pull out, you know, three, four, like, do you have like a go to that you go to? Like, what's your what's your strategy with your calls? So what I like to do is I, I like to have one 
one goose call, one duck call on my lanyard. I always have spares. Say I got a, <clears throat> a reed that's starting to split or, you know, delaminating, and I can drop that call and pick up another one. But I, I do like to keep it simple. I'll throw one goose call on, one duck call on. Duck season's over. I take the duck calls off. Mm. Now, it also depends on kind of where you're hunting. So a lot of our fields are uh, pretty open. They're wide open spaces. So I like a call that's that's fairly loud. I can do whatever I want on but on the other end of that, you know, some of uh, you know some of the spots that I hunt are real tight quarters. They're you know they may have a building on one side, they may have a tree line, uh, so I don't want that big loud call in there. I want a call that sounds super deep, super natural. It sounds like that old gander sitting in there uh, because I don't want it to be real sharp, pingy, and I don't want it to echo. Mm. So you almost feel low call that it's just the old gander in there. Yep. When they buy where you're not, you know, when we're in a traffic spot where we're trying to draw them in from a half quarter, three quarter mile away, you know, we want it loud to grab their attention. So it's nice to have a call that can do both. And then you just, you just finesse it to make like the different sounds. So you, basically you're saying like you have one call, but it can make multiple sounds once you know how to finesse the sounds out of it. Yes, that, but I also, I keep a call with me tuned, though, that is, uh, it is a little bit deeper. It's not a loud call. If I were to blow it out in the spots that me and you hunt, mm-hmm. they wouldn't hear it. So, no, I, I do keep a call with me that, that I got tuned for spots like that also. So, and you said something that was kind of interesting because I know I've heard you say this a couple of times when we've been out, you know, Obviously, we have, like like you said, some places where we go, we have, like, houses and stuff around us. Some places where we go, you know, it's just, like, a highway or, you know, a busy road or whatever. Um, but, you know, the houses, with those loud calls, are you making those calls? And certainly, you know, we're out there, you know, 6, 7, 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. Is that more so worrying about like the residents coming out and like causing trouble or calling the police or the game warden, like and all that kind of stuff? I'm not worried about it. Uh, we we try to make friends with all our neighbors as much as we can and uh, keep it low key. But sure. uh, if I'm doing my job, the uh, they'll be hearing the shots. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> no, most everywhere we hunt, it's been we've been we're pretty fortunate. We got good neighbors all around us, and uh, they they get it. Yeah, yeah. Because that, that's what I was gonna say. Because I don't like the, all the times we've been out. I don't remember any like static or anything like that. I mean, and like you said, you you would think they would they would want to have that good relationship because if they're out there in the fields, then that means, you know, they're not in their yards, take eating up their plants and all this other stuff. And, exactly. You know, one hand washing the other. <laughs> so now we had a chance the other day to hunt with your dad, which I thought that was really cool. You know, my father, is no longer with me and he wasn't a big hunter like he you know enjoyed working with his hands doing stuff out in his shop and whatnot but he wasn't a big hunter but it was just really cool to see you and your dad in your in the blind with us and I know when I talked to you before you know you kind of said he was just a, a big influence but just go through that again for me just talk about how like you know your dad just kind of got you into it and and has been like a, you know, a positive influence on making you the goose hunter that you are. Oh, huge. I mean, from when I was little, I mean, he's always hunted, fished, and uh, trapping is his big thing. He does uh, nuisance control work if somebody has a, a problem with an animal. Right. Um, take care of it. But uh, he's also doing fur trapping, too. But, I mean, from when I was little, um, you know, it, always hunting, fishing, bass fishing, salmon fishing, and that's exactly what I do. I've been fortunate enough to make a career out of hunting and fishing. But uh, it kind of started with, you know, my dad had a lot of photo albums, you know, laying around. And when I was little, I'd, you know, look at him, and that's what I wanted to do. Right. You know, his buddies out there in the blind, and, you know, they had a nice morning and got a little pile of ducks or something. I'm like, "That's, that's what I want. And what really caught my interest was the the calls, the duck calls, the goose calls. That's what I really, really wanted to learn. That's, I mean, it's an art. And I knew that from an early age. 
So he showed me as much as he possibly could. And we kind of took it from there. There was a, uh, there's a decoy and call collector show. Uh, we went down there. I don't remember how old I was. I mean, I might've been seven or eight at the time. I had, uh, saved up a little bit of money all summer. And I wanted to go buy a really nice duck call. And so from going, you know, going to that show and meeting people and, you know, you walk and, you know, can use this guy's call and try this guy's call. And, you know, several people said, man, Brian's really good for his age being so young. Have you ever thought about getting into contest calling? Mm-hmm. Well, you know nothing about contest calling. <laughs> no, tell us more about it. So it's, well, you go and you, you get a set routine, you blow your duck call, your goose call, and you're judged on it and see how it goes. And uh, from then on out, we started looking into contests and going to them. And I think the first contest I ever did was like Indiana State. Um, I took third in that. And just going to contests, you meet so, you know, it's such an awesome, awesome group of people in the hunting and fishing world. And everyone was so helpful. So you just meet all these people and they kind of take you in. They show you some stuff with the calls, you know, at the contest year round, the best of the best. So my parents, my grandparents, they would take a uh, old camcorder, you know, the big one you'd set up on your shoulder that you'd walk around and look goofy. Right. And they would take that, record the contest, every contest that I was at, not just me, not just the juniors, but the intermediates, the pros. So, you know, the whole, you know, it might be a month before the next contest. I'd watch those videos start to finish and say, wow, well, this is so-and-so. He's really good. How did he do that? And I would just kind of work and practice and try to pick up those notes as much as I can. And uh, that's kind of the calling part for me. That's kind of how I've grown with that. The guiding, you know, Matt, when I was out of high school, Matt uh, Porter, uh, for Porter's Hunt Club approached me and said, Hey, would you like to guide for me? Well, yeah, of course <laughs> I, <wanna. laughs> I get to go hunting every day. Yeah, I'll give that a shot. So that's, that's kind of how it happened. And that's where I'm at now with it. Wow. Seven. So it's been going on now, what, close to 20 years, what, 17. So yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That is one hell of a career to be able to pull that much longevity, man, and still, you know, a ways to go for you. So that's that's awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the calling, just to go back to that for a minute, how different is it for, you know, your regular call, you know, when you're out hunting in the field, whatever, and then – your call that you may or routine that you may put together for like a competition, like do they ever cross over? Do they ever intentionally cross over or accidentally cross over? Or do you keep them all completely different? I keep them very separate, especially the duck calling, you know, the duck calling for the contest is, you know, a 20 something, you know, it starts out with a 20 something streaming loud hail call. It goes down and it's the calls are close together. You got 90 seconds to do it. The goose calling is similar, but the goose calling, there's a little bit, there's a little bit more, everybody's routine is a little bit more different. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the duck calling is kind of, if you listen to it, it's kind of a set routine. Um, But when I'm hunting, you know, I try to do the less, you know, least amount of calling as you possibly can, because a lot of times over calling is going to hurt you. Right. So it's kind of the bare minimums when I, when I get in the field there, but you know, it's every day is a little bit different. You know, there's a day where you might be calling them as hard as when you started them is when is, you know, when they're bat, you know, butterflying off the ground and you're shooting them. Uh, you might have another day where, you know, you might shake, you know, the goose flag, the flag two or three times. That's it. You blow a call. They're not, they're not buying it anymore. Mm. So it's a lot of reading the birds, I guess, when it comes down to that, but the contest calling is pretty much strictly for the stage. What uh, can you give? Like, I know you said you had your calls with you. Can you give like a sample of like what you would do for like a, like a contest and then just give like a sample of like what you would do like out in the field? Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, I can do that. So we'll start out with a goose call. So if I mean, I'm just going to give you this, uh, like, you know, the hail call for the goose call uh, in a goose call contest. <laughs> That's kind of the, that would be like what I would do if I were to get up on stage. I mean, if I see some geese out in the field and this is the real deal and I I want to get these things close to shoot, it's... So that's kind of the, the difference between the duck and the goose call. And so... It, uh, or the goose call. So if I were to do the duck calling in a contest, you know, it's going to sound like this up on stage. <laughs> you know, if I'm in the blind, you're you're with me in the blind. We see some ducks. Contest calling versus blind. Now, there's one that you do with the goose, and I know it. I probably won't even come close in trying to replicate it, but it's almost like a a finisher kind of. What goes into into that? It's like that real deep, and it's all like. Is that what you mean? No, I think it's deeper than that. It's like that real, like, almost baritone kind of, like, right as they're coming, like, getting lower and lower. And it's like you give them, like, that last little, like, deep baritone. And then usually by then they are right there on top of us and we just, you know, start whacking them. But it's like you know, a... That makes that noise. It means uh, kill them ain't far behind that. Right. Yeah, it's like that... Like, I guess I know I'm I'm probably screwing it all the way up. <laughs> yeah, that so like that is that like a finisher kind of like just to kind of like seal the deal. Yeah, I mean when you're when you hear them geese doing that on the ground, I mean they're they're on the ground. You hear them; they're walking through the corn rows. That's the noise they're making when they're feeding. Yeah, but they're also doing that too. You watch geese, and you know if you watch them in say the park or you know at the edge of a lake somewhere, and you hear them geese doing that, they're also telling them other geese, "Get away from me! Hey, get out of here! Hey, I got some grass here. This is mine. Get out of here!" And then. You know, right after that, you see them run at each other with their wings because they're going to try to fight and beat, you know, beat each other up over the food. And that's a big thing is these geese are very competitive for that. So it's kind of like a reverse psychology thing. They hear, you know, you make that noise and that's, hey, that's my food. Well, the ones in the air say, well, I want to get some of that food, too. Man, they and it's funny because, like, I've seen I remember. The first time we went out, I'll never forget this because it was the craziest thing that I ever saw. And I remember when I saw it, I was just like, man, if this is what this is going to be like, it's going to be hard not to want to keep coming back. We were in, <laughs> we were in, it wasn't a pit blind. We was in a, like a regular blind. I think it had like a spring close, you know, spring opening close. So it was just like you, you got ready to pop out. You know, you kill them, you kind of like push it and it like flips push it open. open. Yeah. Yep. yep. And we push it open and we whack like two or three. And, but right before, it was almost like a false start. You were just kind of like kill, kill them. But when we pushed them open, when we pushed the, the flap open, there were two in the air. And they were fighting each other in the air, like nibbling. <laughs> at, do you remember that? Like they were. Nib- I do. I remember exactly where we were. For yeah. Sure. They were nibbling like at each other, like just fighting. And it was so funny because, like I said, the group that we were with, we whacked like, you know, two or three others 
But like yep. while this was going on, they were fighting each other and was paying no attention to the fact that they were being shot at or their other I buddies were being that, shot uh, the at. The back one nipped the, uh, nipped the front one in the butt. I, I remember that <laughs> to say that. Yep. <laughs> That was just one, like I said, that was the first time I'd ever been. And uh, and it made me think of that when you were talking about, you know, like po- uh, posing and, you know, fighting for food and stuff. But I just remember oh, yeah. thinking, like, after we whacked, you know, those three or whatever, I remember just thinking about that. Like, man, if this is what this is going to be like, this is not going to, this is going to be pretty good. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Of course, sure. we we have. I haven't seen anything like that since. But it, it's probably it, the only time I ever saw that. But I I do remember that vividly now that you say that. Yeah, like it, that's just one of those things that just kind of sticks in your air. Because I even remember you. You were like, "What the?" <laughs> 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 um, yep, things you see. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's funny because the, the other thing too, and I remember that you said. Um, before and the more that I've gone out and got a chance to go out, whether it's do uh duck hunts or goose hunts or whatever, being in a pit or you know being in a blind or whatever, like it's more of a more communicative, if you know what I mean. Like you can sit and talk. Like then when the down times, we sit, we talk, we shoot the shit. Like if it's just me and you, or if it's just like me and like four or five other guys. Like I can't think of a time where we went, and even if it was like you and the like four of us, and we didn't know each other. Like I might, I know you, but like all the other guys, like we just met like that morning before we went out. And we get yep. in there and we just start talking and just shooting, you know, shooting the breeze. And it's always a good time where as opposed to like deer hunting, 90% of the time when I go deer hunting, I go by myself. And, yep. you know, it's real cool. Or if you go with somebody, you know, you might be texting back and forth. But it's more of a camaraderie. That's the word I was looking for. It's more of a camaraderie when you're in those 100%. blinds. 100%. Yeah, we. That's, that's what I absolutely love about it is. You know, it starts getting cold, and, and, and it does get cold up here. You know, for example, the last day of the season, uh, there were six of us total, and we had three heaters in the blind. Wow. Uh, we, we hunted <laughs> all day. Uh, we didn't see many birds all morning, uh, nothing during the midday, but it was just it was a cold, clear day. We knew it was going to be kind of at the end kind of type thing. We sat there all day. We had three heaters on, and, and I we, we laughed all day. I mean, it, that's the fun part about it is you can sit there, have fun. You know, we hunt up here where we got some uh, floating blinds that we go out to. There'll be three, four of us in the blind, uh, a couple heaters on, 9 o'clock. It's breakfast time. We're cooking bacon, eggs, cash browns right in the duck blind. Man, that, that, the, fir- <laughs> the first time I saw that, too, that was – something that kind of blew me away i was just like wow you just pull out the uh the um the little stove um what do you call those things hot plate you pull out the little hot plate and then you just start yeah. cooking it up and it's just like oh all right well that's you can't beat this and it, and it does <laughs> it, once, once you get those heaters going and especially when we're in the pits when we're underground and you get those heaters going and you got you know the proper layers and stuff it's not that bad. Like, people always fuss at me. They're like, well, you know, I'll be at work or, you know, especially when I was in Milwaukee, you know, I'd go to work or whatever, and I'd be like, you know, this is cold and just, you know, bitching and upset about it being cold. And they're like, well, you're out there hunting when it's, you know, five degrees and minus 10 and da 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 I was like, if I could wear my hunting stuff to work, I wouldn't be cold. <laughs> But if I wear my hunting stuff to work, y'all going to look at me like I'm crazy. Like there's, yeah. a, <laughs> like there's a big difference. hundred <laughs> percent. No, there's something to be said about uh, having a couple of heaters on, being in a pit, getting underground, you're out of the wind. It's awesome. It's a really neat experience. Yeah, I, I urge you know folks all the time like when they see like my goose pictures and stuff. You know, I tell you know go up in in northern Illinois 
And they're like, well, where'd you shoot those geese? And was, like, did you shoot them down here? And I was like, no, nah, I just shot these in Illinois. It's like, we don't, we don't grow geese like this here in Georgia. Like, I've seen the <laughs> geese. I've seen the geese. And it, and it was crazy. And I told you this the other day. Like, I've, I've gotten to the point now where I'm deer hunting at. I keep hearing, especially early in the morning, I keep hearing flocks. And these ain't like one or two, like, lost geese. These are like strong flocks. But there's a lake back um or a pond like a couple of properties over like behind where I, where I hunt at and I'm almost certain like I've never seen them like land like back there but that's where I hear them like where they're going and I looked on the map and there's a pond back there I'm almost certain that's where they're eating at so I'm I told you I gotta see if I can gain some access and and try myself and see what what I could do, even how I would even try to hunt something like that. Because obviously, like you guys, you know, you got the cornfields and stuff up there. So you put the pits in or you got like a nice, you know, some shrubbery on the edge of a cornfield where you put like a blind. I wouldn't even begin to know where or how to start um, to hunt that area. So let me get back to you on that. I might need some pointers. Uh, well, <laughs> I was saying earlier, your homework starts now <laughs> for next year. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, like talking to find it. Well, first of all, finding out whose pond is that, because like where I'm at, you know, there's really especially on my dirt road, there's no residences. It's all like land and uh, woods and, you know, a couple of hunt clubs that have land like around me and stuff. But that's the good thing about that Onyx map. Like you said, you can go on there, find out who it is, take it back what we would consider now old school, but you know, back in the day, that was the way it was done. You know, old school, just right. go and knock on the door, introduce yourself, shake a man's hand and put your best pitch out there and offer him some of the proceeds and see what happens. You know, see what happens. <laughs> so, the worst thing they can say is no. So, but let me ask you this because this is one more thing about the calling before I move on off of that. I was looking at some calling videos when I first started, like, just trying to learn about all of this stuff, like waterfowl in general, in general. And, like, for ducks, like, I would look at some of Phil Robertson's videos, um, mm -hmm. the guy from um, RNT, um, I forget his name escapes me right now, but you know who I'm talking about, the uh, gentleman that started um, R&T calls. Like, I would look at on YouTube, like, their instructional videos, and they would all have a word. Like, Phil's was, like, 10. Like, you know, you said 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Yep, it's yep. Start. For a goose, is there a word? Like, did you start, like, with, a, like, a word or, you know, a, a phrase or, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like, did you have anything like that? Yeah, so, you know, it used to be, so this is going back when the flute call, you know, the long flute call was a big thing. It was guit, guit. Um, But now that the short read game has kind of taken over and you don't see many flutes, so I'm blowing a short read just because they're very versatile. You can make a lot of noises on it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not so much a word but it's kind of what you're doing. You're bringing it up from down below. You're cutting, you're, you're using your tongue. Uh, you're bringing it up. So if I got the call, I don't know how it's going to sound in here, but if I'm going to go and I'm going to blow in the call backwards here to see if it, see how it sounds here. But if I want to make just a honk, so just to do that, it'll go. So it's, it's smooth at first. And then to make that sharp pop, you're uh, you're forcing the air out a little quicker, and you're bringing the middle part of your tongue up to the roof of your mouth as you're forcing that air out. So it's ah 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 gotcha. Okay, okay. And then, like I say, you just start and you start there. Then once you start practicing, you just basically you just build on off of that. Yeah, I mean that's that right there is is fifty percent of. It, you know of it um so then the other part of that so that's a honk or you know the honk you know a cluck is just a little bit sharper and then there's the moan which is kind of the opposite of that so in the call you're going and instead of uh bringing that tongue up to the roof of your mouth, you're actually dropping your jaw to 
to make that lower bottom end sound on the tail end of that note. Nice. Um, okay. So that's a cluck and a moan. And pretty much everything that you've heard me do or anything is basically it's based off of that. You know, it may be running that together in a series of clucks and honks, mm -hmm. sometimes faster, sometimes slower. But everything is based around those two notes right there. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then your, your spread, let's talk a little bit about, like, your decoy spread. Like, oh, yeah. What? <laughs> what? Because I've never counted. Like, when we pick them up at the end of the morning, like, I've never, like, taken the time, like, to – in my, internally in my head just like count them because usually you know it's like 20 degrees and we just want to like get everything packed up so we can get back in the in the truck and get warm so i never really counted. Right, right. but <laughs> there are days that that pickup goes faster and then there are days where that pickup seems like it's going to take a while because there's so many uh -huh. what what number are you running and what is the psychology in the the numbers that you run in. And then you got, you know, the flat panel, which is basically like the 2D decoys. Then you got the full bodies. You got some that are like half bodies that are like simulating sitting on the ground. Like what's your, what, what, what's your psychology? Like what, what's going on with that? So I got a ton of decoys <laughs> and they're all tools, right? So yep. some are going to work better at other times than others. And sometimes I just want to put everything out and just make a huge dark field and just to really attract. So, uh, in my trailer, I got a six by 12 enclosed trailer. Um, so in there all times is like 15 dozen full body DOA decoys. Um, and that's my spread. Most, most of the season, you know, the first couple of weeks of the season, I may put, you know, three quarters of that trailer out and we can get away with that for most of the season there. Mm -hmm. um, but this year, um, as the season got, you know, went on the tail end of it, you know, it seemed like birds were a little bit tougher. They were stale. They've been hunted here. They got hunted all season. Uh, they've been shot. They've been called at. They've seen everybody's, you know, 120 decoys out there. So I wanted to do something different, and I wanted to run a lot more and make it look like, you know, it's late season. The birds are grouped up. They're sitting in big, big bunches, you know, power in numbers, strength in numbers. Right. So, you know, it got to be where I got, uh, I have 15 dozen uh, dive bomb silhouettes. So, okay, we're going to put 30 dozen out today. And the big thing was getting them, not just putting them in a regular decoy spread form. It was kind of putting decoys here, taking a dozen here to this side of the field, 200 yards this way, 100 yards this way. And the theory behind that was to make it look like there's just geese everywhere in the field, but the darkest bunch of them is right around the pit, kind of where you want to shoot them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to look and key in on the other stuff. They're going to check it out when they're working, but they're going to come to the big dark spot just because that's where the food is that's where they think they found the most food and then it got to be where you know at the end i was running once we finally got snow this year um i started running you know, seven eight dozen shell decoys a sleeper one piece shell decoys uh which those were great for putting on top of the pit um they cover us up really well they break up the pit and then when there's snow on the ground you look a lot of times when there's geese in the field a lot of them they're after they're done eating they just go out, they go to sleep. They just sit out there and they're sleeping. They just go out and rest. It's a safe place. They like to be out in the snow. They're melting the snow down so they can eat again for the next day. So it just got to be where I just wanted every single decoy I possibly had out in the field just to get some draw power out there. I wanted those geese from, you know, a mile, two miles away to look over and say, oh, well, that's, that's where they're at today. All right. Man, and it's so... All right, see, so 15 dozen, so I'm terrible at math. That's one and 50 somewhere. Let's just call it 150. <laughs> safe, and then another 150. So you're talking about over 300 decoys. Yeah. <laughs> Give or take. Wow. That. <laughs> yeah, it's like it was, it was roughly, that's roughly 360 decoys. Wow. And then... You set them up, obviously, according to wind direction and, like, basically where you want them to land because, you know, depending on where we're at in the, 
at what field and, you know, whether or not we got houses or, you know, businesses or whatever. Um, and then the, which way the wind's blowing, that's how you set them up to where you want to, where you want them to kind of like land where you kind of want them, you know, to finish off at so where we can kill them, you know, and obviously in the best spot. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We want them. I mean, you know, my goal every day is how can I get these things to be 20, 25 yards right in front of the pit? Either they got to be in front of us or behind us. We got to get, are they going to be coming at us or do we want to crosswind them? Some days it might be better to crosswind them the way the wind is mm -hmm. or that the birds have been working. You know, a pit's the best way to hide, but once in a while they get even a little goofy, a little, you know, nervous of that. So where, where do we need them looking? Do we need them focusing out there? Do we need them focusing behind us to get over the top of the pit? Uh, so that, that comes into play every day, and it's just a matter of kind of seeing uh, on a daily basis how are these birds working. Are there a lot of new birds around that are going to just dive right in as soon as they see the decoys, or are we hunting some tough locals that we got to pull some tricks out? Which And it's funny that you say, like, you know, because you think about the flyway. So you start, you know, in Canada and they work their way down, you know, Minnesota, Dakotas, um, you know, Wisconsin, Illinois. And you just it's funny because you just said, you know, like by the time they get to Illinois, you know, they've seen they've been shot at. They've been called that. So they're already educated. They've seen a lot. And usually it, it's interesting to hear that in Illinois because usually you hear that a lot down here, like down south. Like when, you know, by the time, you know, waterfowl hunters that hunt here in Georgia or especially like in Arkansas, where it's, you know, Arkansas, Louisiana, where it's basically at the very bottom, you know, they're always saying, you know, they've, these birds have been shot at, they've seen it all, they heard it all, they've seen all kinds of spreads, the mojos, all of that. But it's just, it's just interesting to hear you say that in Illinois because relatively speaking, that's not even halfway of the trip, but they're already getting educated that far up. They're educated and, you know, the, their, their flyway has changed, you know, where, you know, 20 years ago and, and past that, they, they were going down to Southern Illinois, mm -hmm. the geese were, and the geese really in big numbers, they don't make it to Southern Illinois anymore. They make it to Chicago land and a little bit, you know, a little South mid state. Um, but really they go from, you know, Michigan, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, here. Yeah, it takes, you know, so we're almost, nowadays, we're almost at the bottom end of their flyway. Uh, we have to have a foot, two feet plus of snow to make these birds here leave. We're just, we're fortunate enough where we are in the flyway and the way things are right now. Uh, we have a lot of geese that winter here in, in northern Illinois. Mm. Okay, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, no, because, you know, I was talking to a fella and he was like, you know, he goes up to Canada um, and starts, you know, up there and then it kind of works his way down. And he was just talking about how, like, they are basically young and, you know, like a lot of young birds, whether it's ducks or geese, um, you know, because they're, you know, young and fresh, just starting to fly. And I guess, you know, depending on, for some people, they're easier to kill, I would guess, you know, because they aren't as smart as an adult or whatever, you know, obviously because they hadn't seen anything yet. But then, but then by the time, like you say, they get into the States, you know, you, so you slaughtered, or I guess since they slaughtered, but you, you know, you've taken out like the, the easy birds and now you're left with all the hard birds for us to, for us to try to get down here in the States. Sure. The easy ones go first. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep. But no, nah, it's still, it, it, it's fun. Now where I know you do a little bit of traveling before you kind of settled down uh, in Illinois. So this year you went to the Dakotas, right? Yeah. Yeah. Went up to North Dakota, uh, like Devil's Lake, right around Devil's Lake. And we hunt, uh, we hunt fields. And, uh, we just, basically it's strictly duck hunting. Uh, we do, we do, uh, shoot a few geese up there, but we're basically setting up hunting dry fields, uh, targeting ducks. Mm. And then, uh, we'll start here, uh, mid October. And then, 
this year I didn't make it down south, but some years I'll go down to southern Illinois to duck hunt or um, even uh, northeast Arkansas is pretty good, too. I'll finish up down there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because even the ducks like in Illinois, I had to learn that, too, my first couple of years, that there's a very short window for ducks in Illinois. It's like, right? Am I am I right? Or it, no, I just... it, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, you know, it's one the thing we fight up here is is freezing up. You know, we could have a very short duck season uh, to where we could freeze up. Um, but, yes, you got to get them when they're, you know, on the move. When they're coming through. You're there. You get a couple of really good days. Uh, you go out the next day. Where'd they go? So you're waiting for the next ones to show up. But yeah, it seems like we got to get them on the move here. Man, well, B, it has been a pleasure. I'm gonna go ahead and get out of here myself and let you get out of here. Congratulations. Um, I know I've told you um, when I saw you, but you, know, you got. A little one coming. Congratulations on that. I know you're going to be, you know, the season wrapped up just in time for you to, you know, take care of your business there. And then before you know it, it'll be October again. It'll be hunting season. (laughs) (laughs) Man, where you, uh, do you have any, anywhere, like where can people find you? Anything like you're posting pictures or anything like that or? Yeah, so. Um, you know, if anyone wants to see what it's like up here in Northern Illinois for the goose hunting, um, so, uh, Porter's hunt club on the Facebook, uh, we try to upload stuff, you know, daily during the season to show people what hunting's like on a daily basis. Um, the Porter's outdoors.com is, uh, it's our website and it's simple. I mean, you can even book a hunt right on the website and to, Come hunting with us. Just call one eight hundred three four five zero two five nine. Awesome, Brian. I appreciate it. We'll be in. I'll be in touch. Uh, we got some other stuff that we need to try to uh, get together on before uh, before October rolls around. But man, I really appreciate you coming on, and uh, thanks for dropping the knowledge. Thank you very much, Adam. Thanks for having me on. All right, Brian. Once again, I want to thank my guest, Brian Griffin, from Porter Outdoors, coming on the show here today. Hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I, as I enjoyed having it with him. And make sure you go into the notes page of the podcast and check out our video that we did um, together, Guides. Um, it was a part of the Outdoor Madness series that we did um a year back uh on our vimeo page uh but the link to that should be in the uh, notes section of the podcast so make sure you go and check that out while you are checking things out make sure you check out bryantlandcountry.com bryantlandcountry.com as i say every week one stop shopping for everything bryantland we got merch we got videos we got past podcasts so make sure you go and check out bryantlandcountry.com. Also, if you have not subscribed to a newsletter, make sure you do that. Uh, the Bryantland Tribune, the newsletter, uh, comes out every week. Uh, there is a area on the website where you can go and sign up for that. So if you have not done so, please go do so uh, as soon as possible. Continue to tell five people to tell five more people about our show, the Bryant Land Show, our podcast and everything Bryant Land that we got going on. And as for me, I'm going to go ahead and get on out of here and catch you guys next week for another episode of the Bryant Land Show. Thank you for joining